Hey there, I'm Chandler Stevens, and in this video I want to share a few updated ideas on how you can go about unraveling tension that you've accumulated in the psoas. Uh, a lot of people think this is something you need to stretch into shape, you need to loosen, all of that, and I find that's really just a counterproductive approach to finding any more sense of ease within your body, uh, any more sense of mobility, of uprightness, all of that. So if we want all of those good things, we need to take a little different tack in terms of how we approach the psoas. And in order to understand why it's so important, it's helpful to know what the heck it even is, right? Because for most of us, it's a pretty, pretty murky area of the body. So I've got a little skeleton anatomical model that can help you understand a bit of uh, your own embodied sense of what your psoas is. Uh, where it is and how it works within your body. Now, it's important to know that the psoas is really a, a pair of tissues that, that weave and interweave within us. Uh, so it's not so much a single muscle, you get two, right? So why? Uh, they kind of hug around this lower area of yourself. They mesh themselves into your abdomen. But what's really cool is they actually attach at each one of your lumbar vertebrae. So on either side of your low back, your spine, at this, these lowest five vertebrae, you have attachments of the psoas. And you can get a feel for this yourself, and it's kind of cool to get a, a bit of an embodied sense of it. If you take your fingers and bring them along your low back like this, Essentially, what you're doing here is tracing the path and the connections of your psoas. And so, take a couple of moments just to breathe, just to be aware of what those connections are. That bit of awareness alone goes a long way. And you might think, okay, so if your fingers are where your psoas is connecting, well, what are your thumbs doing? And in some sense, your thumbs are pointing along the path that the psoas takes. Because as they connect to each of the lumbar vertebrae, they intermingle in some sense. And they'll weave their way down along this line that your thumb is tracing and attach here at the lesser trochanter in your leg. So essentially there's a little bony knob on the inside edge of your femur, you know, the thigh bone, we might think of it. And so the psoas on each side connects from that side of the lumbar vertebrae, weaving together through the abdomen, coming over top of the hip and attaching at this lesser trochanter. Now, in some sense, that gives us a couple of clues as to what the heck the psoas is for. It's a bit mysterious for a lot of people, and quite often it's thrown around that it's a hip flexor. It's like, well, kind of, but that form its structure doesn't give it a whole lot of leverage in terms of flexing the hip. Like, that's not our primary hip flexor. And the role of the psoas is much more nuanced than that. So more so than flexing the hip and bringing the knee up toward you, its primary function involves organizing the spine relative to the movement of the legs. So in some sense, it's the bridge between your legs and your spine. It's what organizes your central axis in things like walking, in things like sitting upright against the pull of gravity, right? And it's not doing so through a constant contraction, squeeze, right? Like, no one is ever after a ripped psoas or a swole psoas. <laughs> it's not something that we want to be buff and hypertonic. It's something that we want to be responsive and adaptive, and as such, uh, it also goes to show why maybe we don't want to stretch it so much. Like if this is the thing organizing your spine, do you want it to be loose? Probably not. <laughs> you want it to be, again, responsive is a good way to think of what a well-organized psoas would be. It's able to communicate in some ways. Communicative is another good word here. Between the lower body and the upper body. And it does so, again, along this really beautiful, interesting path from your low back down through along this line of your thumbs over the pelvis to attach 
at this inner knob, this inner articulation, you might think, uh, of the lesser trochanter. So again, the psoas isn't primarily a hip flexor. It's more involved in organization and responsiveness of your spine relative to what your legs are doing in the field of gravity. And if it's stuck, if it's tense, if it's overly contracted, you are not as adaptive and as resilient as you could be. That really limits your options for quality movement. Now I might think, how does it get so messed up in the first place? How does it get so dysfunctional? Well, one of the things we find when you make a shape like this all day, every day, uh, that has some consequences, right? <laughs> You've essentially taken the psoas and perpetually shortened it. So in some ways, what your body will do is cannibalize some of the tissues involved here. Like if you get the signal that the primary shape your body needs to make is this for, you know, 8 hours a day, 12 hours a day, 16 hours a day, however many hours a day you make this shape, your body gets the signal that, oh, you didn't need all of that length there. Okay, I mean, <laughs> it's energetically expensive for your body to keep all of this if you only ever give it the signal that it just needs that. So that's problem number one, right? One of the primary reasons why so many people, my skeleton's a little messed up, why so many people have dysfunctional psoi is that they spend hours and hours and hours, their entire lives, basically making one shape putting themselves at a right angle. So that's a simple fix. You could move more often too, right? Like you could eliminate the need to search for psoas stretches in the first place by integrating more movement into your day-to-day -day life. Like, please keep in mind, that's a good first step. But another thing that causes a whole lot of contraction here is our body's physiological response to traumatic events, whether that's physical trauma, like a car accident, whether that's emotional trauma, whatever the case may be, when your body encounters a traumatic situation, it contracts away from it, out of necessity, right? It's not like you get this affront to your safety as an individual and you say, yeah, bring it on. No, that would be crazy, right? You would set yourself up for more and more hurt. So what happens instead is you contract away without even thinking about it. And that's a good thing. I should say that, again, that keeps you protected against further hurts. Now, it's only good when you are currently faced by a threat. But what happens for many of us is that we get this habitual contraction away from threats uh, away from stress, away from even just things we perceive to be threats. For a lot of us, there are things we perceive to be threats like uh, crushing debt, stress from our boss, uh, you know, whatever other day-to-day -day stresses you get, the animal part of you is looking at them as predator. So you might contract away from it. And you may never get the experience of decontracting of letting go of that tension. So if you are chronically stressed and crunched and contracted like this, the answer is not to stretch yourself out of it. It's like, yeah, pull on this and pull on that. No, what you're doing when you do that is adding tension to an already overly tense system. So what we're gonna work through in the rest of this video or a few ways to clean the slate on that tension to help you get back to a baseline. And what you'll find is, when you do that, when you give your body the sense of support that allows it to release tension, there is no need for any stretching or any of that kind of nonsense, right? So that's exactly what we're gonna take a look at here. Now, there's one primary shape that I'll have you make as you go through this kind of psoas release process. That shape is called constructive resting position. And I'll show you in just a second, but essentially what you're gonna do is lie on your back with your knees bent and your feet in firm contact with the floor. 
And if you find that you've got kind of a habitual forward head position, you might want a little bit of padding behind you, like a thin book, a stack of magazines, maybe a folded up towel. If you're pretty upright already, you might not need it. But again, if you spend a whole lot of time in this position, you'll find that having some support behind the back of your skull goes a long way. So this is what constructive resting position looks like. And I promise it is as simple as this. All you need to do within a shape like this is be in that shape. Spend 10 minutes within constructive resting position. Again, lying on your back, knees bent, feet firmly on the floor. And what you'll find is that you are giving your body an incredible sense of support. And all of that tension that you may have accumulated in that contracted position, essentially you're giving your body the signal that it no longer needs that tension. So as you are spending your 10 minutes within constructive resting position, I know, 10 minutes, right? Crazy. <laughs> might seem like a lot, might seem like a little. I promise it's gonna be more effective than you think. So as you spend 10 minutes just lying in that shape, what I would encourage you to do is not so much worry about taking a deep breath, because what we often find when someone says, take a deep breath, is you go, <gasps> and you get this gasping kind of thing. And if you're you know, paying attention, you can see that as I do that, I create more tension along the back of myself. That's kind of the gasping reflex. It's part of one of our earliest uh, traumatic reflexes, right? The moral reflex, where we go, <gasps> and then we contract back in. So we want to avoid triggering something like that. So rather than take a deep breath, what I would recommend is have a full exhalation and pause until you get the need to inhale once again. And then repeat a number of times. Literally, you could set a timer for 10 minutes and if you just do that, that'll go so far just in terms of your psoas health. One of the reasons being is that just as your psoas connects to all of your lumbar vertebrae, some of the fibers interweave and are very closely related to your diaphragm, which comes about here, right? So if you can imagine you've got your diaphragm here, which creates that vacuum that pulls your lungs and brings air into yourself, what you're doing when you fully allow yourself to exhale and then take a natural breath back in is in some sense you're massaging those tissues. And if you do this on your back, you'll find it's a bit easier to get a fuller breath without going <gasps> It's silly when you think of it that way. So you're getting a fuller breath. You're giving a different mechanical stimulus to the tissues that make up your psoas. And at the same time, you're giving them a really beautiful condition of support. So they are allowed to let go of the contractions that they've held. Now, of course, natural breaths like this, you've probably heard, are a pretty good way to alleviate stress as well. Particularly if you avoid the gasping sort of breath, right? So breathing is a good way to signal to your body that you are safe. Doing so deliberately, doing so with some tension and attention goes a long way for alleviating some of the stress that contributes to this overly tense system in the first place. So 10 minutes within CRP is gonna go a long way. If you wanna take it a step further, here's what you could do. So from CRP, we're gonna go through a number of repetitions of this movement, and it's gonna be very small at first, and it'll gradually get larger and larger. Now, what you can do within this position is allow your knee to fall a little bit out to the side, just a bit, just until you feel the first hints of a catch within that movement, of a clutching here. So you don't need to go all the way out. There are no bonus points for pushing your end range. 
But you can go through that a number of times, letting the knee fall to the side, bringing it back in. And as you do so, you might be curious what the quality of this movement is like. Does this feel like a smooth, controlled movement? Is this jagged in some way? Does the movement catch anywhere? Or do you find that you almost ratchet through the range of motion? And so as you go through this a number of times, can you see if each time through you make the movement a little smoother and a little smoother? And eventually, you might get to the point where you find that you're on the outside edge of that foot. And in that case, what you can do is let this movement grow organically in some sense. And you might begin to lengthen your foot away from yourself a small amount, and then you could just return to that original position. And so again, each time through, ask yourself if you can make this movement a little bit smoother, a little bit easier. Again, what we're looking at is release here. Not stretching, not forcing, not pulling. So as you let your foot lengthen away from you, you'll find that your leg is making this gentle arc. It's a really beautiful shape when you really watch it, and when you really experience it for yourself. And so it might take you 10, 20, 30 or so iterations of this movement to really find that you can lengthen your leg with a sense of ease, without rushing, without pushing. And when you do find that you get to that point where your leg is lengthened out and away from you, you might take a pause. Because this is a very different shape than this, right? As we've talked about, finding this length through the leg is pretty uncommon for a lot of us. So take a couple of moments here just to let your body acclimate to this. This is providing a whole new world of sensory information for your nervous system to process. So after you've taken a few breaths there, a few moments to really experience what has changed within your body, you might slide that leg back up. And at this point, you've got an option. You could repeat that on the other side, or you could roll through one side, make your way up to a seated position, and gradually you could make your way up to stand. And within the standing position, you might take a couple of moments and just check in with yourself and sense what's different about your experience of your body on the left side versus the right side. What are some of the signals that you get that you've worked with one side rather than the other, right? There are going to be subtle differences between the two sides at that point. And so within that standing position, you might just bring awareness to what has changed side to side. And of course, you might be tempted to go back through and balance it out. I'll say that you could. You could go through and do that same process on the other side. But you don't necessarily need to. Because your nervous system is very intelligent. And even going through that on one side, it will learn something about optimal organization and you'll find that there's a certain amount of carryover to the other side as well. So even as you take a few steps walking around the room, as you carry on with the rest of your day, you'll find that some of these changes start to integrate themselves into the way your body functions. So, pretty cool, right? Now if you'd like to take it a little bit further even, I want to share one more process with you that you might use to again create just a sense of connectivity between your spine and your hip, between your leg and your upper body, and you'll find that this is a really nice way to create some space within your psoas as well. And not just lengthen it, but make it responsive, make it adaptive, uh, make it very functional. That's what we want in the first place, right? Now in order to do so, you'll make your way into a side-sitting position. Whichever side you want. I've got my feet pointed over to the left for now. And you could have a hand by your side for support. 
Now, if you find that this position is already uncomfortable, you can modify it all you want. Again, arm here for support is great, as long as you're not collapsing into it like day at the beach, right? Again, you want some sense of aliveness through this side of yourself. But you might find that you want a little bit of padding underneath your pelvis. You might find that your knees are a little uncomfortable and like a little bit of blanket under them, for example. Make yourself feel as comfortable as need be in order to spend some time in this shape. Now you'll see that already this is unfamiliar. This is a different position than most bodies find themselves in throughout the day. This goes a long way all on its own. But what I would recommend if you want to take this a little bit further is you can bring this free hand to your opposite shoulder. And a few times, imagine that you could lengthen away from your back foot as you look over top of this other shoulder. Now, you'll notice that I'm not cranking myself to look as far as I can. Just as you worked through before, you're going to go through a number of iterations of this. And each time through, you might be curious, how much length can you find within yourself as you go through this rotation? Again, we're not twisting ourselves. Because that's like playing tug of war, and we don't want to do that at this point. You can lengthen away from that back leg and look over your opposite shoulder. And over time, you might find that you can start to see farther and farther with more and more ease. And of course, each time you move in and out of this position, your psoas is getting a very different stimulus than it's used to. And your body adapts over time based on the stimuli that you introduce it to. And so each time you go through a movement like this, you're sending a very different signal to the cells that make up your psoas, right? All the way from this inner edge of the groin, up through the abdomen, around the back. Just picture it for yourself, what all is happening on each side of yourself as you go through this easy rotation this supported rotation. And again, if you do that 15 to 25 or so times, moving slowly through each side, you'll find that when you make your way up to stand again afterwards, you have a very different sense of your uprightness. And maybe you start to take a walk through the room as well. And pay attention to what's going on within each leg. Do you get a sense as you take a step that this leg is free to swing in front of you, to catch you as you take your next step? Well, you'll find if you make a consistent practice of this, these three things, CRP, that leg spiral, and then this seated spiral as well, is that you create an incredible sense of ease and aliveness within your tissues. So rather than stretching them into some shape, having them loose, or having them overly constricted, hypertonified, what you find is they are resilient, they're springy, they're supple in some sense. And that is what makes really good quality movement. So, can't recommend it enough. Get in the consistent practice of this kind of stuff. Uh, if you have any questions about this or other related processes, you can drop them in the comments below. And then I also recommend head to chandlerstevens.com where I just share a ton more resources about this and all other things, movement and mindset. You're going to love it. So thanks for watching, and I will talk to you soon.